All right. Uh, at this time, will all sergeant at arms in charge of recordings please start? PC recording has started. Thank you. According to the crowd, all set. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Lugo, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Borelli, we are ready to begin. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Commissioner and everyone, and welcome to the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. Uh, my name is Joseph Borelli. I'm the chair of the committee, and we're joined by council members Maisel, uh, Deutsch, uh, and Cabrera. Today, we will review the fire department and the New York City Emergency Management's fiscal 2022 budgets to understand how they address the needs of all New Yorkers. I'd like to begin by thanking the members of the fire department for their sacrifices over the past year. Uh, the frontline responses of EMTs, in particular paramedics uh, and firefighters, have been on full display throughout this pandemic. Uh, and because of their direct life-saving actions, our city is a safer, better, uh, and more recoverable place. Uh, the fire department's EMS members and firefighters are known as New York's best and bravest. I believe those nicknames are aptly given. I'd also like to thank the members of New York City Emergency Management as they have been working incredibly long and difficult hours uh, to assist the city's response, performing a job that often does not get the recognition it deserves. Uh, the fire department's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget totals 2.1 billion with 17,288 positions. The FY 2022 preliminary budget has undergone moderate changes, decreasing just $12 million since adoption. The department did not have any new needs and federal funding supports the majority of the FY 2021 increases, primarily from the State Homeland Security Grant and the Urban Area Security Initiative Grant. The fire department's fiscal 2021 through 2025 capital commitment plan totals $607 million and supports 281 distinct uh, projects. The pandemic has offered a unique insight into how essential the fire department's mission is to the city. With hundreds of fire and EMS stations across the five boroughs, we should assess the need for additional fire and EMS resources throughout the city to ensure a proper emergency response and continue to look at how best to improve the operations through the expense and capital budgets. The committee has held oversight hearings on various topics over the past year about the city's emergency preparedness for a second wave of COVID, the failure of the city's 311 and 911 systems during Tropical Storm Isais, and recently a hearing on and passed legislation regarding film site safety, strengthening the ability of firefighters to respond to emergencies at film sites throughout the city. There weren't any new needs in the November or pre preliminary financial plans. And with the many recent changes due to COVID-19, the committee would like to revisit some of the budgeted and programmatic priorities raised last year. EMS members fill a cr critical role and continue to earn far less than other first responders. The diversity of the fire department still lags behind other uniform agencies and the makeup of the city's workforce as a whole. And we would like an update on the relocation of Rescue 1 and EMS Station 7 in the Hudson Yards area. I would also like to discuss the EMS revenue increase, the EMS mental health pilot team programs, the fire safety inspections, uniform promotional exams, and the safety of EMS members, which, as you know, has recently come uh, and become front page news. I would like to thank our committee staff for their hard work, financial analyst Jack Kern, who put on his best tie today, I see, uh, unit head Aisha Wright, committee counsel Josh Kingsley, policy analyst Will Hungach, and my chief of staff, Frank Masha. I'd also like to welcome and thank Commissioner Nigro uh, and all the uniformed EMT and firefighter uh, administration folks that are here, as well as their civilian staff. And this being most likely our last uh, budget together, uh, I just want to say thank you for um, having basically four years now of a very cooperative and productive partnership between 
your agency and the department uh, and the council, excuse me. So I look forward to hearing from you, commissioner uh, and the committee council will now swear you in. I just got a text, so let me just check. Um, nope, that is for me and not for the public. So thank you very much. And I will uh, I believe the only colleagues I have are still Maisel, Cabrera and Deutsch. So if that changes, we'll let you know. Committee council, please swear them in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, Council to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, after which you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who is the next panelist. The first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the New York City Fire Department. Testimony will be provided by Commissioner Daniel Nigro. The following individuals will also be available for questions. First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Chief of Operations Thomas Richardson, Chief of EMS Lillian Bonsignore, Deputy Commissioner for Budget and Finance Lizette Christophe, Chief Medical Officer Adam Prezant, and Assistant Commissioner for Recruitment and Diversity Nafisa Noonan. I will call on, call on you when it's your turn to speak. Um, during the hearing, if council members have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Um, I will now call the representatives of the fire department to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and uh, respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Nigro? I do. First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. I do. Chief Richardson. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Kristoff. I do. Chief Prezant. Chief Prezant, are you uh, unmuted? Okay, we'll just continue, I guess. Um, and last is Assistant Commissioner Noonan. Oh, and I, and I guess Chief Bonsignore is also there. Um, hold on for a second, Chief. I do, you can hear me. Okay, awesome. I do also. Great, thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner. <laughs> okay, good morning. Chair Borelli and all council meeting members present. My name is Dan Nigro and I am the commissioner of the New York City Fire Department. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today about the year that we've had at the fire department and the outlook for the year ahead. I am proud to report that when confronted with one of the most challenging public health emergencies in the history of New York City, the members of the FDNY elevated their performance to meet the challenge head on. While COVID-19 has touched the lives of every New Yorker, our extraordinary emergency medical technicians, paramedics and firefighters were among the first people in the city to confront the virus. At the peak of the crisis, they labored through the busiest days in the history of EMS, responding to 6,500 medical emergencies a day. It was an immense burden on our workforce, but we took early action that prepared us well to handle the rapidly expanding workload. We shored up internal resources, remained flexible, and frequently adapted policies to meet the changing needs of the operational environment. And we called upon our partners in the private sector and municipalities across the country to aid in the fight. Courageous EMS personnel came from all over the United States <clears throat> to lend a hand. By pulling together our EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, officers, and civilian support staff were able to fulfill the department's mission to keep New Yorkers safe during some of the toughest times the city's ever experienced. Even as we succeeded in the field, the virus took a toll on our members and their families. 14 members of the department passed away due to COVID related issues. One visiting paramedic from Denver, Colorado also died after traveling to New York as part of the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Ambulance Contract. 
The fire department introduced safety measures to protect our members, working with the FDNY Foundation, the mayor's office, and our fellow city agencies to set up alternate accommodations to provide members with the option of staying in a hotel to decrease the risk to their own families. We partnered with NYU and Northwell so that our members could visit a broad range of sites to receive free testing. Once the vaccine became available, we worked with New York State and negotiated to receive our own supply of vaccine so that we could begin vaccinating our members as quickly as possible. We began with three vaccination sites and have since increased to five locations, two of which serve eligible city employees from other agencies as well. As of March 17th, we have performed over 60,000 vaccination doses. This includes approximately 13,500 first dose vaccinations for FDNY members and approximately 25,000 first dose vaccinations for employees of other city agencies, as well as more than 9,500 second dose shots for FDNY members and more than 12,000 second dose vaccinations for employees of other city agencies. Not a single recipient has experienced a serious side effect. However, it's not just the physical effort affects of the virus that take a toll on our members. EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters spend each shift, day in and day out, responding to emergencies. During the heaviest period of COVID responses, members were responding to cardiac arrest and death totals that reached previously unseen heights. Our counseling service unit ramped up their outreach, <laughs> logging on to thousands of virtual counseling sessions to provide support for members in need. CSU maintained an active 24 hour hotline so that members had the option of speaking with a live counselor at any hour of the day. They also trained additional peer support personnel who visited firehouses and EMS stations. The department performed targeted outreach to members who were quarantined or isolated with their families, checking on their well being and delivering personal protective equipment. In addition to the extraordinary work of the Bureau of EMS, the fire department also had great success last year with regard to firefighting operations. New York City experienced 63 civilian fire deaths in 2020, which represented a 5% decrease from the previous year. It also marks the 15th consecutive year of fewer than 100 fire fatalities. We do not take this achievement lightly. To put this trend into historical context, context when I began my career with the fire department. In the 1970s, we routinely experienced hundreds of deaths with 310 in 1970. That number stayed high for a long time with 285 deaths in 1980 and 275 in 1990. The progress of the last decade and a half is the result of well-trained members responding quickly using top of the line firefighting and emergency medical equipment, providing unrivaled medical care, inspecting buildings and areas of public assembly to eradicate unsafe conditions and thoroughly investigating fires. We also know that if a fire does occur, one of the biggest factors in the occupants emerging safely is a working smoke alarm. By partnering with the FDNY Foundation, the American Red Cross, alarm manufacturers, and the council since 2015, we've distributed approximately 200,000 alarms and installed more than 110,000 alarms. We also make it a priority to proactively educate members of the public to help them avoid experiencing serious fires. As many council members know firsthand from experiences in your own districts, prior to the pandemic, a large component of our public education campaign consisted of in-person presentations. Teams of firefighters and retired firefighters visit schools, community centers, senior facilities, and public housing complexes, to name just a few, to conduct fire safety presentations. Often the presentations are geared toward the audience 
or seasonal points of emphasis, such as upcoming holidays. Without the ability to gather in person, our ability to perform traditional outreach was severely curtailed. However, the team quickly retooled and shifted their focus to conducting outreach using the methods available to them. Using video conferencing and remote instruction, the department was able to continue educating the public by performing fire safety education, mobile CPR, and maintaining the fire department's usual brand of aggressive community engagement. Faced with the inability to send teams of educators into classrooms, the fire safety education unit developed a digital curriculum for school-aged audiences. The curriculum was shared with administrators across the city and promoted to more than 500 schools, United Federation of Teachers, borough chapters, and private schools. They developed an online curriculum for adult audiences and worked with community partners to share the information with senior populations throughout the city. We were even able to host a full calendar of events for Fire Prevention Week in October. Though of course it looked a little different than it has in previous years. Members of the Fire Safety Education Unit held more than 30 outdoor tabling events throughout the five boroughs, working with community groups and elected officials to complement that effort by promoting fire safety messaging through email blasts and on social media. The highlight of the week was a virtual educational event that took place at the Fire Zone in Rockefeller Center with more than 3,500 New York City students tuning into the event. These efforts were bolstered by the fire department's own social media platforms, where the department shares a wide variety of content, including public service announcement on topics such as safe cooking, properly using smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, and creating an escape plan. Overall, educational content posted to social media in 2020 had a total reach of more than 149 million views. The fire department's youth workforce and pipeline programs also had an historic year despite the complications of the pandemic. At Captain Vernon A. Richard High School, FDNY instructors worked with DOE partners to successfully transition to virtual education. We were able to maintain full enrollment in the EMS 101 course, which is provided as a junior year elective and the FDNY prep course, which is provided as a senior year elective. For the last decade, the fire department has conducted a job readiness final for FDNY prep scholars that involves students sitting for a mock job interview with members of the department's executive team. Determined not to let the current state of events interfere, our youth workforce team created a program of virtual job interviews and students were able to meet with executive staff such as the first deputy commissioner, the chief of operations and the chief of staff. And I joined the group myself for a post interview chat. We held a surprise graduation party for our FDNY prep scholars traveling to their homes with a caravan of FDNY vehicles and gift bags. We conducted both winter and summer installations of our EMS Youth Academy programs and 56 students completed their New York State EMT basic certification and filed for civil service. That represents the largest ever number of FDNY youth participants to become certified EMTs in a calendar year. This program has been a great success for the city of New York. In all, 100 former FDNY youth participants have been hired by the department. We look forward to developing new members through this program for years to come. Given the current fiscal environment, I do not have a great deal of new spending to discuss for fiscal year 2022. However, I do want to highlight funding that we received for the mental health response pilot that we are partnering on this year with health and hospitals. In the case of calls regarding nonviolent mental health emergencies in which the individual does not possess a weapon, the city will dispatch a team consisting of two EMTs and a health and hospital licensed clinical caseworker to respond to the individual. Calls that include violence or, which, or in which the individual is believed to have a weapon will be routed in the traditional manner 
which includes a response from the NYPD. The safety of our members is paramount. So precautions have been taken to design a program in which EMS members feel secure. Training for the members of this pilot will be conducted by several agencies, including FDNY, DOHMH, and the NYPD. And we worked directly with the unions in establishing the qualifications of members who are eligible to participate. Like any pilot, this will provide us with an opportunity to learn and develop best practices. We are hopeful that the results will enable us to provide better care for New Yorkers experiencing mental health emergencies. I am optimistic as we look ahead to the coming year. I take great pride in the resiliency of our members and their ability to perform under enormous pressure in the most demanding of environments. I hope that the people of New York share this sense and that a silver lining of this turbulent period is that they feel reassured that no matter what obstacles arise, the fire department will answer the call and immediately begin working to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll note we've also been joined uh, by Council Members Brannon uh, and uh, I believe in his first uh, uh, meeting of the committee, uh, Council Member Gennaro, welcome to, uh, of course, welcome back to the Council, of course, and uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I'm gonna begin with some questions and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Forgive me, my printer ran out of ink, so I'm, I'm not buying Bitcoins or, or playing games if I, you see me using my computer uh, to get some of the questions that we have discussed previously. Um, Commissioner, you mentioned that there is no new spending to discuss and that makes sense given the, the pandemic and the fiscal problem the city now faces. But is there any, are there any goals, departmental goals that you have planned out for the next seven or eight months um, before the new administration comes in? Well, I think, as you said, the, uh, we certainly don't expect funding for any new programs. So our, our efforts are to, to shore up the programs we have to ensure that they, uh, they're all working as they should. And so far they are. Um, we will be hiring EMTs. We'll be hiring firefighters. Uh, we hope to be promoting. And uh, I think the department is looking forward to better times, uh, fiscal times. We have in recent years uh, enjoyed those times, and I'm sure that uh, economics in the city will improve uh, as COVID fades, and I'm hopeful that it will. Thanks. And uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, promotional exams, and I could just speak from experience that this is a topic that um, more than one group of, of individuals that, that work for you and is, are extremely pleased to work for you. I uh, have reached out to our office and uh, have, have spoken at our committee before. Um, so can you just go through the, the how, what, and why some promotional exams have been delayed um, and what the status is with DCAS being able to schedule the next round? Sure. Um, this is a subject that's personally very important to me, being someone who uh, sat for many promotional exams and knew the importance of it and how important it is to members of the department to have the opportunity to advance. So, of, of course, in these times, our exams are, uh, are hands on and we've had to pivot to find new ways to, uh, to administer exams. Uh, we have active lists right now for battalion chief, deputy chief, fire marshal, et cetera. What we're concerned, most concerned is lieutenant and captain rank and firefighter. So the current lists uh, will expire in August of this year. And we have not yet held an exam for either captain or lieutenant, but we are working uh, with DCAS very closely on the next captain's exam. Um, they believe they have a way to conduct it and we're optimistic that we will be able to hold that exam uh, before this fiscal year ends. That's the exam promotion to captain. And as soon as we have a word that uh, we have a formula and a, and a plan to administer that, and we think we will, we will begin working on the lieutenant's exam uh, to hold that as soon as possible after the captain's exam. So that's, okay. that's currently the, where the outlook. So the, the goal for captains would be to have it before June 31st, or June 30th, there's no June 31st. That's uh, before, correct. 
Okay, and then the lieutenant's promotional exam would shortly follow. And then how long would it take to, to grade and, and develop the list uh, that you could hire off of? Well, traditionally that takes um, up to a year. So you can see that as the other exams expire in August without being extended, which is an option, uh, there will be a gap between the old list expiration and a new list that would be able to use. So the two options we would have is to uh, is to either extend the uh, the existing list further, or to promote additional people at the very end of the list in August to cover that gap until a new list is available. And is there any is there any decision? I mean, I, I'm only asking for more clarity because, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there are you know a hundred or so people that are on these lists uh, who, you know, are in very very uh, compromising positions in their life and they just want to have answers for their families uh, and for their careers. So, I mean, do, do we have any indication of whether we'll be uh, hiring from those lists past August or not? I, I think, it, again, it depends on which option is taken, whether it's an extension of the list or uh, promoting people in August to fill that gap between, between the time uh, the list expires and a new list is available. Uh, I, I wish I, you know, had that crystal ball for each and every one of those members because it is a difficult time as you sit on a list and wonder whether you'll ever be promoted or not. Um, but I would, I, I would have them all be opti as optimistic as possible, and as soon as the department has anything more definitive, um, we'll certainly release it. Uh, okay, and, and do we have an idea of, of how many companies are, are short-staffed, uh, both with captains, lieutenants, and firefighters? Well, currently the, the short staffing is in the firefighter rank. So um, we had to delay probie class. The next probie uh, class will be 100, approximately 150 in May. And I think we're already uh, about 300 members short in that rank. As far as officers are concerned, um, the shortage is not, is not as serious yet, but you know we have attrition each and every month. Um, People leave the department, many for medical reasons, and therefore um, the department needs move as uh, each month goes by, the uh, vacancies increase. So we have to take that into consideration as we look to whether we will uh, extend a list or hire additional people to fill those gaps. Uh, um, the last firefighter exam was December of 2016. Um, and the following year, so fiscal year, I guess, 2018, there was a 20% attrition rate for EMS, which is far more than any other non-seasonal job in the city of New York, I, I believe. Was the necessary hours and the man hours uh, to staff EMF, EMS uh, spots, was that made up with overtime or was that made up with additional hiring? And do we expect the same uh, situation to occur after the 2021 or 2022 uh, uh, firefighter exam? Well, I think it was the, uh, the gap was filled in both ways with the overtime tours, but also the department um, staffed up beforehand. So we were overstaffed in EMS anticipating the number of members. It was actually somewhat more than we anticipated uh, in that list. But right now in, uh, in the EMT rank, for instance, we're um, uh, we're overhead count. We're short in paramedics, we're over in EMTs, and we hope to uh, uh, correct that with the next group of uh, paramedics coming out and we'll increase the head count for paramedics. But um, so our head count is good and we'll, what we'll try to do again before the next uh, promotion exam from EMT to firefighter would be to staff up in, in anticipation of losing some of those members. I mean, outside of pandemic uh, related costs, would you have expected the EMS over time to increase this fiscal year? I would not have, no. Okay. Um, to stick with EMS for a moment, this committee's heard some testimony over the years, you know, adjacent cities like Philadelphia um, have starting salaries for EMTs of, of $57,000. So it's, you know, 
35% really uh, more than the FDNY EMT starting salary. Um, can, can you talk about any efforts the department is undertaking to increase the EMS members wages so that they're comparable? I mean, I, this is a question that gets asked every time. I mean, do you, does the sure. department what raises and, and uh, what can we do to make it happen? Well, we certainly appreciate the council's uh, uh, efforts and the support of our EMS personnel. Uh, I don't think you'd find anyone in our department that does not think that our EMS members should make more. But as you well know, uh, we don't control the process. So negotiations are going on now um, between union leadership and uh, uh, OLR. And um, we wish them well, you know, we, uh, we realize that they are hardworking, dedicated people um, who perhaps do not receive the compensation they should for this work. And for good reason, commissioners don't control the wages of, uh, I think all of us commissioners of various agencies would uh, increase the budget in that way and it would cause problems for all of you. So, um, that's it. The negotiating process is is uh, difficult. It's so you, you say everyone in the department, though, is is in favor of of increasing the, the wages or would like to see that just to be personal. Does that include you? And, and have you um, expressed this position to the mayor uh, and to OLR? Sure, I, I I personally believe they are not compensated as they should, um, but I also realized the process involves more than that. And um, it is a very difficult situation for negotiators to come up with something. And, um, you know, we've done smaller things, uh, uh, additional pay for rescue medics or uh, Aztec uh, folks to try to increase uh, avenues for people to make more money, uh, increasing the class sizes for paramedics uh, who make more than EMTs, but as far as being able to, uh, you know, wave a magic wand and say, here's the new salary ranges for our, our folks, we can't do it, and we can only depend on negotiations. So, um, again, to stick with the EMTs, uh, on March 5th, as you're undoubtedly aware, uh, an EMT was bit on the face uh, in Sheepshead Bay, uh, you know, and, I mean, great food in Sheepshead Bay, probably shouldn't be anyone's face. Um, but this is just one of a number of horrific injuries that EMS members have uh, encountered when responding to emergencies. Now, we the data we have shows that there were 1774 service-connected injuries uh, last year in, in FY 2020, the most in any fiscal year, 10% uh, more than the last five-year averages. So does the department keep specific um, specific track of the number of job-related injuries that are due to assault? Yeah, we do. Uh, I can get you those numbers. They were fairly similar for the last two years, very close. Uh, we don't see a large uptick. But, yeah, I mean, that being said, and especially you point to that one hor horrific incident, and there have been others, uh, one is too many. You know, it's a it's a serious crime. It's a felony to assault an EMT, and it should be uh, punishable by up to seven years in, in prison. And um, again, you know, it, it points to the dangers of this job. People, our EMTs and paramedics can't treat people without being up close. And the mechanics of that injury, where here was a, a, a paramedic doing the best they could for a patient, which meant... Um, being very close to them when that patient decided to attack them. Uh, there's no way for them to do their job without this personal close contact. And it just lends itself to the dangers of being an EMT or a paramedic in our city that go on, you know, a million, 400,000 calls and, and some very small number, but serious number of these calls can escalate into this type of dangerous situation. With the mental health response teams, the, the, the pilot now happening in, in Harlem, um, number one, do you do you see it working? In other words, would your recommendation and perhaps Chief Bonsignor's recommendation be that it continue and be expanded? And if so, have we seen any assaults related to those type of responses? 
Sure, I'm going to start and I'm going to pivot to, uh, pivot to, to the chief. Um, I believe if the, the calls are triaged the way they should be, that these teams will not respond to calls involving dangerous individuals and that if situations change, we can summon help in a timely manner. So uh, let me have uh, Lillian expand on that because she's been involved right from the beginning in this, in this project. Chief? I think we have to unmute Chief Monsignori. Right. Yeah, there you go. I think I'm good. Uh, yes, thanks, Commissioner. Um, this particular project is is um, an important change of how we respond to mental health crises uh, by taking a, a medical approach to to this particular type of call. This program has not actually started yet. We we have not responded to any of the jobs yet. We still are in. Um, the development stage of this program, working very closely with our union presidents and partners. Uh, we're working with uh, New York City Thrive and NYPD, developing out the curriculum for, for the multi-week training. The train is, training is expected to be a joint training consisting of about five weeks of targeted training for this particular type of response. This program is really geared toward the low acuity EDP type call types. So these are folks that are not immediately identified as uh, violent. There is no weapon, uh, not who homicidal, not suicidal. Who makes I'm the sorry. dispatcher? Yeah, so, so we've uh, developed um, questions that the dispatch, you know, the uh, call receiving operators will go through to sort these particular job types out. So the, there, there will be one critical type job type, which would include reports of a weapon or violence, uh, any kind of suicidal, or imminent suicidal or homicidal complaints. And then there's the other call type, which is the lower acuity call type, uh, which would be, you know, nonviolent, no weapon reported, um, not imminently suicidal or homicidal. And that is the group of assignments that this particular unit is targeting. So this response unit would consist of two EMTs and a, and a social worker. Um, if at any point the situation became uh, dangerous or aggressive or uncomfortable, we have direct access to NYPD. They are aware of our presence and they, we have uh, the ability to talk directly to their dispatcher. So they would respond if we needed any help but we have not actually started this program yet. Great, thank you. Um, I, I wanna get into more general revenue and, and, and expense questions um, before I turn it over. The, um, on the revenue side, the, I mean, and the revenue has dramatically increased uh, from the, the actual 187 million from FY 2020. Um, you know, we're talking about a 60 or 70% increase. So wh why is EMS projecting a significant increase? I I'm hoping to hear that it's because of, um, you know, some of the pressure our committee has put on uh, the, the department to start actually recovering some of the costs of, especially the, the, the billable and insured patients, but some of the costs incurred in transporting uh, folks and treating them. So can you just go into why we see this revenue increase? Well, we have gotten approval for that. So the fees that are charged for transport and, and, uh, and also for uh, care uh, have increased. And therefore um, our revenue will increase from, tr from our transport and treatment of patients. I don't have the exact numbers, perhaps uh, Deputy Commissioner Christoph can help me with those numbers. Uh, they don't come to mind quickly, but they, she I guess might the, have them. the questions we have, though, are, are basically what percentage uh, of the department's current rate to transport someone does Medicare and Medicaid actually reimburse transports? And then once the CPE funds are received, what will the new percentage of the department's current rate be? Like, how, how, how are we doing? How are we going? How, where, where are we going kind of thing? Uh, Chairman, I'll have to get that for you. I really I don't have that 
breakdown right now, but I'm sure it's available to us. Does, does the department as an entity uh, negotiate with CMS? So we are working. There, uh, that, thank you. No problem. Um, you, you are right that the majority of that increase is tied to the CPE conversation. So we have been working very closely uh, with New York State to increase the amount of federal reimbursement we get for our Medicaid transports. Um, and so we are, we are actively in that process. So right now, the, the rates that we get for Medicaid and Medicare are based on a fee schedule that they set. Um, through CPE, uh, which stands for Certified Public Expenditures, our Medicaid reimbursement will increase to be based more on what our actual costs are for transporting Medicaid patients. Um, so if we don't negotiate directly with CMS, uh, we have to go through the state. It has to be part of a New York State Medicaid plan amendment. But we, um, we, have, to, we have to justify the costs in order to put that, that cost forward and, and then use that as leverage to recover more money, correct? Yes. So, so if EMS, uh, EMS and EMTs and uh, paramedics were being paid slightly more, that would be sort of a, a justifiable cost, which with, which with we would then negotiate with CMS? If, if there were changes to our costs, they would be reflected in, in our expenditures um, and they, they could impact uh, the amount of reimbursement that we receive, but there's already a big gap even with our existing costs. Um, I think there's always gonna be a gap. I mean, when you go to the dentist, you, know, you, you get your bill three weeks later and it's never what your insurance pays. So I, I respect the fact there's always going to be a gap, um, but if, if we do like my dentist and we inflate the cost a bit and hopefully recover some more money, that's probably beneficial to all of us. But what I'm saying is if we push the costs up through higher wages for EMTs, that cost potentially could be borne to some degree by reimbursement. Now that we're actually- The key word there I think is potentially, uh, Jerry. It's, it it does potential, but it goes through New York State and it's not automatic. So, um, but I see where we're going here. It's a incentive for us uh, to get additional funds should our employees earn additional uh, salaries. I mean, I'll be I'll be optimistic about that. So, I mean, hopefully, that is something that uh, could continue uh, continue to uh, to go forward. Um, I'm going to turn it over to. I know at least one colleague of mine has questions, Council Member Cabrera. And if anyone else, please uh, feel free to use the raised hand feature, but I'll turn it over to Council Member Cabrera now. And once again, uh, Commissioner and your staff, thank you for uh, always being a, a very willing partner uh, and to all uh, the chiefs and to the civilian uh, employees of the department. Again, thank you. And we'll thank you for your support. I'm ready. There you are. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the chair. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, Commissioner, welcome. I want to thank uh, uh, in public all of the members of the FDNY uh, for the great job uh, and courageous job uh, that we saw this last year. Uh, I want to bring two things uh, to your attention, and it's, uh, one of them is echoing our chair when it comes to the EMT. I, I find it, I always find it ironic uh, and now serving as a council member for the last 11 years that we always struggle to find funding for the EMT workers. And yet uh, for, the, for a race, uh, and yet we always seem to find a way to come up with different lines, workers, or, and for that matter, all throughout the system, uh, create new jobs. Uh, and what I come to the conclusion that it's not a lack of funding. Uh, we had had years of prosperity uh, barred this last year, years. Remember one year we had $3 billion in excess, uh, unexpected funding, and yet, we seem not to be able uh, to find the funding for those who risk their lives uh, day in and day out. The second thing, because I only have uh, three minutes left here, is the issue of the exams. When it comes to uh, 
come to my attention, we only have, when it turns to captain, only half of 1% of captains are minorities. Uh, I've been here for a long time, been in this committee for a long time. And I have heard all the reasons why uh, we cannot increase those numbers or we haven't, or we wanna do better. Uh, and yet we have a new exam that you wanna put forth and you have enough people that have taken the test, passed the test to move the needle. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm calling upon you, Commissioner. I want you to leave a tremendous legacy here that you are the one who are able to move that needle. Because one thing to have at, at the entry level, it's another thing that we're never gonna see the levels of chief and higher position in the FDNY if we don't have the captains. And, and we have enough in there right now in the pipeline waiting. They've been waiting, they took the test. They, they, they you know, as you know, that test is a very difficult test. Uh, everyone here, uh, just about everyone here uh, that is, is in your team has taken that test. It's not an easy test. And then just to be put out uh, in August and not being given the opportunity when they already passed it. Now, somebody might come back to me and say, well, we don't feel like they're prepared. Then I will say, where is the mentorship? Where is the mentorship that is required to bring the next level of people of color to be there? When I first got into the council, the Vulcans had to get in and fight because we have problems with the test. And now we are here 11 years later and we're dealing with such a long numbers, but you, you can make that happen. You can make that happen. I, I, I'm gonna be optimistic. I think we, we have a, an optimistic group of council members here today that we could see that needle move. Please help us with that because I have to tell you that some of the members are starting to believe that the test that is coming up uh, is, is to bypass, in order to bypass some of them that really have a great chance and they're needed right now. It's not like we don't need them, uh, we need them. And I think that they are prepared uh, and they are ready uh, to do this job. Uh, we have to have a system a system in place. I just don't see a system in place to making sure that people of color make it to the higher ranks. Okay, I'll address this second part of your question first. And if there are you know, people of color, lieutenants right now who are on the current captain's list, um, there's a likelihood that we'll reach their names and they will be promoted. You know, the process is, as you say, you take this difficult test, you get on the list, um, perhaps they're in positions now that either, and I, as I said earlier uh, to, the, to the chairman, um, when this list expires in August, we will either promote additional people then to fill the gap before the new list or extend the list. So therefore, I would be optimistic that some of the folks you may be talking about uh, have a likelihood of being promoted. And, and we, we hope now that... Uh, before this administration came in, this department had, had sunk to such a low number of people of color. And we've now raised that number up and these people are becoming eligible to become lieutenants and to become captains. And it's exactly what the department needs. So I share your interest in that. And hopefully we are moving in that direction before this administration ends. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I'm, I'm gonna, uh, and by the way, uh, the reason why the numbers move is that it's because there was legal action that took place many, many years ago. This is before uh, you came in, Commissioner. So I, exactly. I don't want you to carry that water, as you remember. Uh, and so, but what I want to see is that, uh, and and I'm I'm hearing something that uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my anchor of hope on your words that we can see some of these members become captains and change the percentage. The percentage is so low. It's probably the lowest of any agency in the city of New York, any department 
Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe the best, and I'm going to assume the best. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair, you. for the extra time. Oh, no problem, Councilmember Cabrera. It'll be, I'll, I'll get my pound of flesh out of you next time, my friend. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Brannon. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, how are you? Good to see you. Um, you also. Uh, so I'm going to hit on my two refrains that I always ask about. Do you have a, um, so far, I know we're, we're just about out of um, the extreme cold weather for now before we get into extreme heat. Do you have a, um, a list of the, the times where uh, the, the fifth fire, the fifth firefighter has been um, called for during during the this this past winter. Sure, let me uh, let me pivot to Chief Richardson for this. I'm not sure he has it in front of him, but he can he can tell you some of the criteria that the department uses when we do uh, make that change. Tom. Good morning, sir. So morning. I can tell you that this past winter there were two times where we activated and implemented the fifth firefighter in the engine companies due to the uh, impending storms. So when we think about doing that, me and my team, along with the chief of department and the fire commissioner, we collaborate and we discuss uh, the impending weather. We look at the forecasts uh, and typically uh, one of the benchmarks that we typically use is when we're going to see upwards of 10 plus inches of snow. Uh, then we'll start thinking about the fifth firefighter. That's been the benchmark uh, for the, in the past. And so we continued that this year. And actually one of the storms, uh, we, we weren't even uh, close to that. You know, we were going by the weather forecast, but we did it twice over the winter. So you do it based on forecast of, of snow and not, and not temperature? Typically we'll do it as it relates to the snow accumulation only because of the issue as far as slower response times. Then once we get there with the deep snow, we use the extra firefighters to help us get hose lines into position uh, more quickly. So that's typically the benchmark that we use, yes. Okay, so we, you know, I, there, I can't legislate this stuff, but I have, you know, I have a couple of resolutions that call on FD to either fully, ideally fully reinstate the fifth firefighter or, um, you know, have a, 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 instead of having to sort of call it as we see it, um, reinstating the fifth man anytime we have extreme weather, whether it's code blue in the winter or uh, it's extreme heat in the summer. Um, I mean, normally when it's a code blue, isn't that usually what, what would trigger a fifth firefighter? Well, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, code blue is fairly often. I think we'd be more likely, and we're certainly not budgeted to, uh, to do this at every code blue occasion, um, at not just when it snows, but some unreasonably cold or unreasonably hot stretch of weather, uh, we could look at that when we really, you know, the chiefs believe that this would have um, an adverse effect on our firefighting and we can, um, we can reassess at times other than um, snowstorms. I, I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think there might be some, um, I think it would have to be a little more extreme than a, a code blue situation. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see it just be, I'd like to see it um, be some sort of standard thing, right? So it's not always scrambling to figure out if we need it or not, right? If, if, if the weather hits a certain marker or, or the, you know, the, the forecast is calling for whatever it is, then that should trigger ideally a fifth firefighter. Um, well, the, the UFA has yet to uh, um, get a contract and they're, they haven't bargained yet. So it's something that they could, because it affects that, uh, that union greatly, they could look for in collective bargaining as that collective bargaining goes up, either the increase in the number of units that are, uh, working with a fifth firefighter regularly or an increase in at certain weather conditions. 
Okay, quick, really quick. Um, this this month is going to be 25 years um, since uh, EMS was uh, uh, combined with FDNY. Um, do you think that that is, uh, you know, do you think that's separating uh, those two agencies again and making EMS its own department would be a way to uh, a, or a pathway to fixing the the inequity? Time expired. Well, um, the fact that I was around when we did merge, and I can tell you uh, there were about 2,000 people in New York City EMS at the time that were not well paid, that were not well supplied, whose ambulances were breaking down regularly. Uh, I don't think EMS should, uh, should be looking to go back to that. Um, I don't think that's the magic solution to better working conditions for them. And uh, I'm hopeful that through negotiations, uh, we can reach a better place. All right, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to, the last topic uh, before uh, we have the next panel, and I'm sorry I forgot earlier, is on the inspection side. Um, can you give us a, a briefing and, and maybe a rundown really of um, the impact of COVID-19 related inspections on the, the normal um, examinations and CFO work and, and uh, sprinklers, sure. et cetera. Thank you. Uh, you know, as COVID had an effect on so many other things, um, we're 72 short staffing wise in Bureau of Fire Prevention and working very hard towards uh, staffing those positions. Uh, and that besides COVID uh, added to the, the delays or the, the time it took for us to do inspections um, while COVID took place, some of our inspectors were taken out because the, the way the balance this was, uh, is a delay in inspection worth uh, uh, putting people, which could be life-saving in COVID activities. So a certain number of our inspectors were switched to COVID activities, doing inspections for uh, uh, illegal activity or unsafe conditions. and it resulted in an increase in the inspection time, in the delays. Uh, those people are all back right now. So we are hoping to close the gap again. And we are hoping that by filling these 72 positions in the near future, um, this delay will be behind us. But I think it was worthwhile to have these inspectors, these uh, loyal folks who are out there working every day while other people maybe were not or work, had the luxury of working for, from home. They were out in the street uh, fighting COVID uh, in other ways, ways that they didn't expect before this came. And we thank them for their service in that regard. And now they're back to their usual tasks. And we think that, uh, and we're also working with uh, uh, folks in the industries on how to streamline some of our processes and uh, decrease the delays for them. So uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of ways we can help and that's all coming together right now. Thank you. Um, so I just wanna just convey on the record um, the importance it is to expedite and get as many of these people. I'm sorry if you could hear that my neighbor's doing some work if you, if you could overhear that, that noise. That's okay. Challenges in working from home. That's what happens. I just want to convey the importance of getting these inspections uh, back on track because the economic recovery of our city certainly rests a great deal on uh, their ability to help the building industry go forward. Thank you. We certainly understand that. Thank you. Uh, next panel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I believe we're moving on to NISM, uh, New York City Emergency Management next. Um, <clears throat> so the next uh, panel will be uh, New York City Emergency Management. Testimony will be provided by First Deputy Commissioner Andy DeAmora and also Chief Finance Officer Stacy Rosenfeld. Let's see, I believe that we're, they're currently logging on. So just bear with us for a second.
I see. I see Andy is on. If we could unmute him, perhaps. Yeah, let me see that. He was having some issues connecting to the audio, it seemed, but let's see if we could get him on. Probably a good time to point out the amount of screens and cameras they have uh, at the uh, OEM. You have me now? Yes. Hold on, we just. Hello. Yeah, you're here. Okay, one second. Take your time. Also, no, we are joined by Council Member uh, Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, are you ready, sir? Yes, yeah, so just see, uh, is my other is Stacy on? We okay. Do not, I do not see her on. Okay. Just give me one second to get my finance person, make sure she's on. Okie doke. Okay, sorry for the delay. No problem. So should we begin or? Yes. She's joining us, okay. Um, so thanks again. Now we're gonna hear testimony from New York City Emergency Management. Um, before I begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner De Amora. You're okay. unmuted now. Yes, yes, sir. I, I agree. I, I affirm. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I still don't see Stacy on, but let's just, you could start with your testimony. Is she in the room with you or? She's right here, she's walking oh, in, come on. Hi. Okay. Stacy Rosenthal. Cool. Hello. Um, Can you see me? Sorry. If you could just affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony. I absolutely do. Great, thanks so much, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Borelli and members of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I am Andy Diamora, First Deputy Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. I'm joined today by Emergency Management Chief Financial Officer Stacey Rosenfeld. Clearly, it has been a year like no other. We have been fully activated for COVID-19 for more than one calendar year, the longest activation of emergency management in history. During this time, there have been multiple overlapping activations, heat emergencies, snowstorms, and trackable storm ESAEAS. We have responded to over 500 incidents, including building collapses, fires, infrastructure incidents, and more domains, held 88 outreach events, sent approximately 3,300 notified New York City and NYC messages, released nine podcasts, and provided over 500 notifications to elected officials. Emergency management also assisted with large scale programs such as Get Food, Get Cool, and the Vaccine Command Center. All this while continuing our non-emergency work, mandates, and responsibilities. Additionally, this year, emergency management was in the midst of an organizational realignment that streamlined the agency into five bureaus and executive offices. The new bureaus mirrored the national model for emergency management that views disasters as recurring events with four phases, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Reorganizing around this national model allows us to build and administer the new capabilities necessary to reduce risk 
prepare our communities, and minimize the consequences of emergencies. The agency also formed an Equity and Diversity Council as an employee-engaged approach to both facilitate discussions on issues and concerns regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to integrate the aforementioned structures into the agency's mission, operations, and strategies. It further develops and maintains an agency climate that welcomes and promotes respect for the wide variety of human experiences. Allow me a moment to express my gratitude to the more than 200 dedicated professionals at emergency management who have literally worked around the clock over the past year in an unending activation cycle. We continue to look ahead to find new ways to prepare the city and our citizens for the next emergency. With that, let me now provide a snapshot of our budget for next year. Our projected total fiscal year 2022 city tax levy expense budget is 28.1 million. We rely on our city tax levy expense budget to support the majority of the agency's administrative, technological, and operation costs. The projected fiscal year 2022 city tax levy personal service budget is 6.4 million, which supports the 63 personnel lines paid directly through our tax levy funds. This includes 1.5 million in funding for 18 staff members dedicated to working on increasing communication and services to people with access and functional needs. Our other staffing is supported through grant funds and personnel on assignment from multiple city agencies. Our projected fiscal year 2022 other than personal service budget is 21.7 million, which covers all agency operating and administrative costs. This budget includes a significant portion of non-discretionary funding. These funds are, des are designated to cover our warehouse lease, utilities, and telecommunications costs, including the maintenance and operations of our emergency operations center and backup facilities. This money also supports our fleet and all additional equipment, supplies, and materials needed to run the agency. The agency receives grant funding to support many of our core programs. In the past year, we secured $32.7 million in federal funding, primarily through the Urban Areas Security Initiative Grant. This funding is vital to our ability to run many of our finest initiatives, including the Ready New York Public Education Program, Community Emergency Response Team Program, Continuity of Operations Program, Geographic Information Systems, Training and Exercises, Watch Command and Response, and Citywide Incident Management Systems Planning, and the Emergency stock, uh, Supply Stockpile. We work with City Hall, OMB, the city's congressional uh, delegation and our partner agencies to push for full homeland security funding in future years. This money supports critical operations within hours and several other agencies budgets and is critical to the city. In addition to our regular mandate during the COVID-19 activation, we put in place approximately 100 contracts to support the city's COVID-19 response. This includes contracts to support medical staffing for hospitals and nursing homes, hoteling of people exposed to COVID-19 who needed a safe place to isolate, PPE for essential workers, shelf-stable food for vulnerable populations, and a renewed sign language translation contract to ensure all New Yorkers had the access and support they needed during this very difficult time. We continue to work closely with OMB to ensure the city's reimbursed by FEMA for all eligible costs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to working with the council on issues of emergency and readiness and response. And I am now happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, the first question I have is basically about the vaccine distribution. Can you just explain the agency's role in the distribution, if, if there is any, uh, and what the agency's involvement on setting up vaccine sites, et cetera, are, if there is any. Yeah, thank you for the uh, question, uh, uh, Chairperson Borelli. Um, we are involved uh, with the Vaccine Command Center. We have personnel assigned there in a supporting role, uh, leading the, uh, the uh, help in the, uh, the coordination with logistics and some contract support as well for the different vaccine sites. Uh, we also have uh, some personnel out at vaccine sites doing uh, checks, make sure things are going well. And during the pandemic, has your vision of what needs to be stocked in the city's emergency stockpile changed? 
um, as it in, began to include more PPE and, and stuff like that? Yeah, at this time last year, we were all uh, scrambling as a city, state, nation to find PPE. Now we're in a much better place uh, than we were last year uh, regarding PPE and other things as well uh, regarding the pandemic. And just, uh, I guess my final question is about the, the funding. You know, obviously the federal funding uh, is not included in our projection for next year as it is in every year, but there are no positions funded federally that, that are going to fall off a cliff at any point uh, where we're gonna lose it if we don't immediately get replenished. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, we have uh, just uh, been, uh, uh, have permission also to fill 15 vacancies that were on grant. So we're moving forward with filling personnel vacancies as well. Okay. I mean, I have no more questions for you guys. Um, I'll give a second for the other committee members to raise their hand. I'm shocked with all the cameras and screens and conference rooms uh, you have at OEM you pick to use uh, your office uh, I, I know we had something going and of course something happened <laughs> and <it's> virtually <laughs> well, i don't see anyone else so thank you very much thank you sir have a great weekend and uh council we will get the next panel absolutely um thank you everyone we're now turning to public testimony i'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings we'll be calling on individuals one by one again council members use the raise hand function on zoom if you have any questions once the panelists has completed their testimony um, we will now like to welcome, to start, Oren Brazile from the EMS Union. Go ahead, Oren. Time starts now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, committee chair and all the council members. Uh, before I start, I would like to say my gratitude to uh, Commissioner Daniel Nigro for his uh, work with the FDNY and his support for FDNY EMS. The proposed 2022 FDNY budget is to be applauded. However, it does nothing to address the reality of the situation at the emergency medical service. Historically, the pre-hospital care providers have been too subjected to a regiment of benign neglect. It is imperative that the budget allocation be aligned with the most pressing needs of the EMTs and paramedics of the 911 system. The current situation of these heroes is, become, is becoming dire with each passing hours. The coronavirus has resulted in a totally unique situation. We have seen an unprecedented unprecedented number of out of hospital cardiac arrests from an average of 80 calls of cardiac arrest a day to over 500 cardiac arrests a day, all of which involve patients of younger age than pre-pandemic. The result is my members are struggling with feelings of hopelessness as they attempt to save patients. This war zone is causing people to lose sleep, start drinking, become depressed, Three of my men have committed suicide. Others contemplating suicide. Psychiatrics and psychologists show emergency medical technicians and paramedics are at a higher risk of, develop, of developing post-traumatic stress disorder because of the pandemic. Yet there is zero funding for any type of mental health initiative targeted to EMTs and paramedics. Meanwhile, the FDNY provides zero funding to address this impending crisis. Perhaps it's just another instance of institutional indifference or simply benign neglect. Last year, over 200 of my members of the service were assaulted in the line of duty. The most horrendous of which was a cannibal-like facial bite. We have requested, no implored the fire department to institute conflict resolution training coupled with basic self-defense training. Apparently the department is comfortable with its members being assaulted on a daily basis as there is zero funding for these suggested initiatives. Currently more than three quarters of the issued ballistic vests have exceeded the manufacturer's recommended lifespan, essentially rendering them less than useless. 
yet the department has steadfastly refused to replace these life-saving articles. This year, four of my men were robbed at Gine Point while performing their duties. I am not sure what else will take or what else needs to happen before these issues are addressed. Perhaps another killing of one of my members. The fire department recently celebrated its 25th anniversary of the FDNY EMS merger. That saw the commissioner issue a proclamation expressing his respect for my members. Meanwhile, the department fights us on tooth and nail at the Office of Labor Relations as we strive to attain a true living wage. They deny all requests to fund initiatives that are paramount to our health, safety, and well being. I will have uh, some things that I would like to discuss if I'm allowed uh, regarding some of the questions that the council members have. Yes, please. Um, every so often we hear uh, the mayor's office, the department uh, use the excuse of our wages are so far apart because of collective bargaining making it seem like we don't know how to bargain for our members or suggesting we don't know how to bargain. The fact is it's the city that's fighting us back. It's the city that pushes back. It doesn't matter how many times we demand equality and fairness, we're not being heard. It's not given to us. We need to stop with this collective bargaining excuse for the disparity of pay. Uh, they're going to start a mental health response unit. We're not objecting to it at this time. However, when is mental health going to come to EMS? Our men, I heard, men are hurting. You continue, please. Our men and women are hurting. Not from what only what they've seen, but from what they're experiencing on a daily basis. Members being assaulted and no justice given to anyone. It's been four years since Yadir Arroyo has been killed and we're still having hearings whether this man is eligible to be held in court. They tout that they established a peer support for our men and women. While it's great that we have peer support, these are EMTs and paramedics who are only going around to talk to them. However, when they encounter a member who is experiencing PTSD, they have no instruction or direction of what to give them. The FDNY needs to hire psychiatrists and psychologists to assist our men and women. They can't afford to go on their own to see a psychiatrist or psychologist. The wages are so low, how can you afford a co-payment? I'm glad that fire deaths in New York City have declined. This needs to be acknowledged that our fire prevention inspectors are responsible for that. They too are now in danger as the fire department have pulled out some safety measures. They have taken away their CO meters. They have taken away their bunker gear. These are all safety equipment that needs to be carried at all times. I'll take any questions you have. Thank you, Oren. Uh, I don't believe I have any questions for you. Um, I'll give the committee a second and it doesn't look like anyone else does. Thank you very much as always, Oren. And thank you uh, on behalf of the city uh, to all your members. Uh, we appreciate uh, everything you all have done over the past year. Thank you. Thank Council. you. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, next for public testimony will be Ryan Monell from the Real Estate Board of New York. Um, if you go ahead, sir. Time starts now. Well, thanks, Chair Borelli and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to, to testify today. Uh, very appreciative of the earlier questions in regards to, to funding and staffing levels around uh, the, the Bureau of Fire Safety. Um, you know, 
I think I'd be remiss if I said that we weren't grateful for, for the opportunities that we've had to speak to um, the department uh, about uh, the wait times for inspections uh, that our members are facing, uh, particularly as it pertains to larger um, uh, projects uh, in Manhattan. And, and you know, we, we've faced um, increasingly long wait times over the, the past couple of, of years. Uh, this actually predates the pandemic. Uh, so I am understanding and, and appreciative that the fire department is doing what they can to, uh, to help keep people safe. Um, and that might have required folks to um, uh, be moved from the, the inspection um, um, aspect of, of, of the work of the department. But, um, you know, this is an economic development issue that we're now facing. Uh, if, if there's a conversation that can be had in regards to increasing uh, not only the budget for um, the Bureau, but also uh, staffing levels um, is something that we look forward to working with the council and the department to do. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping that we can get wait times, which have, have gone to upwards of 11 weeks, uh, which of course affects the ability to, for a, a project to attain a TCO or a certificate of occupancy uh, uh, to, to getting that number much lower. Um, and so, you know, we want to continue this conversation. We understanding uh, that funding uh, might be limited, but there's opportunity to continue, to continue that discussion. Uh, we appreciate uh, the ability to work with you. So with that said, uh, happy to take any questions, but thank you, Chair Borelli, uh, for your time today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manel. Uh, Council, any questions or next panel, please? Uh, that is the final panel, sir. So you could close out when you're ready.